next I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today, Elaine Mills. Elaine is from our class of 2012. Um, she's a master gardener who is active in many parts of our program. Um, she is um, especially interested in sustainable landscaping and native plants. She is a member, um, a very active member of our social media committee. Um, she helps with um, the photography, Facebook, um, she does Instagram, she's a multi-talented woman. Um, she's also a coordinator at our Glen Carlin Community Library Garden. And um, Elaine, I'm ready to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Welcome to everyone who is able to make it to um, our live presentation and to those of you who are watching the recording. Uh, this is a joint presentation by the Arlington Alexandria Unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension and Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. Uh, it's in the Sustainable Landscape Series. And today we'll be talking about invasive plants and native alternatives. To give you an overview of the talk today, first of all, I'll be giving you some definitions. What do I mean by invasive and native plants? Uh, the, the bulk of the talk will be about the po problems that are posed by selective in selected invasive plants. And then I'll be presenting you with some native alternatives that have similar characteristics that could serve as substitutes. Uh, toward the end, I'll be describing some techniques for controlling invasive plants, provide some resources on both invasive and native species, describe some nearby locations where you might see native plants, and finally give you some local sources for actually purchasing native plants. So to get started, uh, I'd like to answer the question, what are invasive species? And by definition of the presidential executive order from February 1999, invasive species are alien species. They're non-native species that are introduced into a, a particular ecosystem. And they can cause harm in a number of different ways. Uh, they can cause harm uh, to the economy. An example of that would be zebra mussels that, uh, that bring uh, charges of $1 billion in damages to water inlets, to the hulls of boats, uh, to the motors of those boats. They also really damage uh, beach areas of affecting uh, the tourist industry. An example of uh, an invasive species that causes harm to human health is the giant hogweed that many of you have probably heard of that has uh, a toxic chemical uh, in its stems and leaves that can cause uh, severe burns to, to the skin of anyone who touches it. What we'll be focusing on today are invasive plant species, place, uh, species like porcelain berry that cause harm to the environment. Uh, I'd like to describe some challenges of invasive plants. First of all, they may be overused in gardens, creating a really limited palette. They have unhealthy or very aggressive growth habits. They don't necessarily remain in our cultivated home plantings. They'll actually sp uh, spread to natural areas. And when they arrive there, they will outcompete and suppress our native plants and affect the whole balance of ecosystems and biodiversity. They don't have any natural predators and they're very difficult for us as humans to control or to remove. And finally, they don't provide any support to our local native wildlife. Where do invasive plants come from? Well, many of them were introduced to the United States as desirable. Most of them come from either Europe or Asia, and uh, they came to us as sometimes as, as long ago as with uh, the, the early colonists, certainly within the last uh, several hundred years. Some of them already existed in our home environments when we purchased a home and, and had a, a brand new garden. Uh, they can be spread by wind, water, or animals carrying the seeds. And unfortunately, a good number of them are still sold in the horticulture trade and unknowingly purchased by homeowners. An example here is burning bush at a, at a local nursery and these popular ground covers at a, a box store, at English Ivy, Pachysandra, and Vinca. And I was certainly um, among those 
who uh, had invasive plants in my uh, landscape when I purchased my home. And I also unknowingly uh, purchased some of these plants uh, before I, I learned about their invasive tendencies. So I'm going to be recommending that we substitute native plants and I'd like to describe what those are. They are species that have evolved over time by interacting with the soil, the climate, uh, fauna, and other plants in a certain region without any human intervention or cultivation. And as far as North America is concerned, these are species that were here prior to European settlement. Here are some benefits of using native alternatives. They possess desirable ornamental characteristics. They're adapted to our local growing conditions, the, the climate, the soil, the water patterns. And very importantly, they have evolved with local fauna. Uh, for example, they provide nectar and pollen for adult pollinators. This example here shows uh, a, a bee on a cup plant. They can serve as larval hosts for caterpillars. This example shows the caterpillars, the caterpillar stage of monarch butterflies on common milkweed. Uh, we want to have plants that support not just the adults with nectar and pollen, but support the whole life cycle of our desirable insects. And finally, native plants can offer fruit and shelter to birds and other wildlife. This example shows a, a mockingbird on a native winterberry shrub. You might have questions about which native plants to use. Well, here in Virginia, we're very lucky. We're uh, in the central part of the East Coast. So we're at the Southern end of the range for plants that are native to the, to the whole mid-Atlantic and at the northern end of the range for plants that are native to the southeast. Our local uh, naturalist, Arlington County naturalist, estimates that we have maybe 1,300 plants uh, to choose from that are native to our region. Um, also, here uh, along the fall line, we can choose from plants that are native to the coastal plain, Alexandria's in the coastal plain, and to the Piedmont region. So quite a few plants to choose from. Now I have provided uh, a plant list and I, I hope you've been able to get access to that. We have provided direct links uh, on the homepage of our website, mgnv.org. And the plants that I'll be talking about today are listed as invasive in Arlington County and the city of Alexandria in Virginia. Many of them are uh, invasive well beyond that, certainly in Northern Virginia, the whole state of Virginia, and perhaps even areas beyond. For those of you who might be attending from other regions, um, I'll be giving the, the range of these invasive plants as I discuss each one. And you can certainly talk with your local uh, extension agents to get more information. Now, what I've done is I've created um, plant lists that where we'll, we'll talk about all these different categories of invasive plants. For example, we'll start with grasses. So bamboo and Chinese silvergrass are two examples of invasive plants. These are links that will take you directly to fact sheets to give you even more information than I can today about those plants. And then there are also direct links taking you to fact sheets on the native alternatives. And I'll describe those fact sheets a little more at the, at the end of the presentation. So we'll start looking at some invasive grasses. And our first example is bamboo. There are multiple invasive species. This was um, a set of plants that was introduced from Asia as ornamental back in the 1800s. And now they're invasive all the way from Maryland south to Texas. They grow at quite a tremendous rate and they dominate sites creating a monoculture that displaces both through crowding and shading of other plants. They can also in our home environments cause damage to pools, decks and foundations by their invasive roots. For those who have looked to bamboo uh, to provide vertical interest and screening, I suggest uh, these two grasses as possible alternatives, bottlebrush grass and river oats. 
bottle brush grass, Elimus hystrix, is uh, a cool season grass. It grows in upright clumps uh, to about four feet tall, and it has strap-like leaves, not unlike those of bamboo. Uh, those leaves serve as a uh, food for uh, the larvae, the caterpillar stage of uh, Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths. A uh, bottle brush has very distinctive flower heads that give it its name, and they bloom from June to August, and the birds will eat the uh, resulting seeds. This is a very shade tolerant plant, uh, probably the most shade tolerant of all the native grasses, and it's also tolerant of uh, drought and deer. My other example is river oats. Chasmanthium latifolium. It grows slightly taller, up to about five feet tall, and again has strap-like leaves. The interesting thing about this plant is the oat-like seed heads that change colors through the seasons. They start out a pale green. In the middle of the summer, they'll be this, this pink, and then they turn a, a, a tawny tan. Uh, the leaves of the plant serve as um, a larval host. And uh, this plant uh, can spread quite vigorously. And here is a point I would like to make. Native plants sometimes are mistakenly described as being invasive. As I pointed out with that um, earlier slide, it's only the, the non-native plants that are accurately described as invasive. Uh, the term that we would be using to describe a vigorously growing native plant would be aggressive. So you can take advantage of this vigorous growth if you want to have this grass spread and control erosion on a bank. Our second invasive grass is Chinese silver grass, a very popular ornamental grass, Miscanthus sinensis, another plant that was introduced from Asia in the late 1800s. This is now invasive in uh, many of our national parks in Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, and it also invades roadsides and clearings. Its seeds are dispersed by wind, and then they can build up over time in soil seed banks, and it also spreads through rhizomes and has little wildlife value. If you were looking to this plant for both ornamental interest, uh, especially in winter, and uh, vertical interest, I suggest you might look at little blue stem or switchgrass as native alternatives. Little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium, uh, has these lovely uh, blue-green leaves, giving it its name. It grows anywhere from 18 inches to four feet high in sunny, dry conditions. And uh, it has flowers in August and October, and the foliage turns uh, to bronze or a rusty color in the fall. It uh, develops these lovely sil silvery white seed heads. Uh, the birds eat those. It has both uh, ornamental winter interest and the, the grass will linger uh, in an upright habit and provide uh, winter wildlife cover. My other example is switchgrass. Panicum virgatum. It grows taller at three to six feet high and it has this vase shaped clumping habit. Uh, because it was a, a prairie grass, a grass native to the uh, Midwestern tall grass prairies, it, uh, it grew in very sunny, dry conditions and it has developed a deep root system. And you can use that uh, if you plant it to contro help control erosion. Uh, in the spring, it will develop these airy pinkish flower heads that will actually dry and persist through the winter. And it, those will provide a, both a food source and cover for wildlife. There are many different cultivars available, uh, lots, of, lots of different colors uh, to, to the foliage. This particular example here turns up a, a tawny red. One other uh, invasive grass that I don't have time to talk about today is fountain grass. And I discuss both that plant and so many other native grasses, sedges, and rushes in this earlier presentation that I gave uh, for Master Gardeners. And that uh, recording of that presentation is available on our website. And you'll see that listed in the resources section of the handout. Moving to some invasive ground covers, uh, perhaps the most notorious is English ivy. 
This was introduced by European colonists and now is invasive throughout the entire mid-Atlantic. The problem with this is that when it grows vertically, uh, it, it uh, develops fruit. The birds will eat this and then disperse the seeds of that fruit into native areas, uh, our, our forests. And uh, it can also be spread inadvertently when people uh, dispose of their yard waste. They may just dump it over a fence into uh, a, native, a natural area. Uh, and unfortunately, even st stem fragments will root easily. When it grows in our forests, it smothers and kills trees, and it also reduces light to any of the plants uh, growing in the ground levels below. Additionally, in our home landscapes, it can harbor both rats and mosquitoes. Uh, it's been traditionally uh, regarded as uh, the go-to ground cover, but I'm going to recommend some other native ones. Uh, the first is Fragrant Sumac, the Grow Low cultivar, and the other is Virginia Creeper. Uh, the Grow Low cultivar of Rus aromatica is a dense ground-hugging shrub. It's only about 18 inches to maybe three feet high, but it can spread quite wide, six to eight feet. It grows very vigorously and it, it does well in, in many urban conditions. I've seen it used, for example, on sloping hell strips, those, those narrow hot strips in parking lots or at curbsides. Now I wanted to point out it's in the same family as uh, Rus toxicodendron, which is poison ivy, and the leaves might lead you to believe that it could be problematic, but those leaves are non-toxic. Uh, it grows in sun to part shade, and it has this brilliant uh, fall foliage. My other example is Virginia creeper, Parthenocissus quinquifolia. This is another example of a fairly aggressive native plant. It can spread 30 to 50 feet, uh, which makes it good if you want to use it as, as a ground cover, very effective for erosion control. Uh, it can grow with vigorous tendra, uh, tendril climbing. Uh, and uh, the one alert to give you is not to let it grow on buildings. It could be damaging both to wood and brick and stone. Uh, it has these really interesting group of, of five leaves and those develop a, a gorgeous fall color. In addition, it uh, grows this uh, fruit that birds can eat, but a warning that fruit is toxic to humans. Looking at another invasive ground cover, a liriope. This was introduced from China and Vietnam as an ornamental. And uh, it's spread uh, by seeds from, from the flowers, the pollinated flowers, both by birds and mammals, and now threatens natural areas throughout the mid-Atlantic. Uh, I've personally found it to be quite an aggressive spreader in gardens. Uh, I had some landscapers plant hundreds of these plants and uh, when I discovered that I really wanted to remove it, I found that the runners had traveled under the cement of my sidewalks. And I'm, years later, maybe a dozen years later, I'm still finding stray plants that are difficult to eradicate. If you would like to have a grass-like evergreen ground cover, I would suggest these two alternatives. One is Appalachian sedge, and the other is plantain leaf sedge. Appalachian sedge is Carex apalachica. It grows only about six inches high, but spreads about 12 to 18 inches wide in dense tufts. Uh, it is a really attractive edging plant. As you can see here, it would fill in that same uh, use that you would put liriope to, but also you can use it uh, very effectively uh, massed on slopes for erosion control. It has these very delicate inflorescences, flowers that uh, grow from April to May. And the nectar of those uh, is used uh, uh, by native insects. And then the seed that forms is used by both birds and box turtles. 
plantain leaf sedge, Carex plantaginea, is probably the most ornamental of the native sedges. Again, it grows uh, only about six to 12 inches high, about one to two feet wide. And it has these wide strap-like leaves. They're about an inch wide with this interesting crinkly uh, parallel veins. Uh, this leads to its second uh, common name, which is seersucker sedge. Uh, the leaves provide nourishment for, uh, for Lepidoptera. It's an evergreen plant, has these really interesting alternating uh, lime green and maroon stems for the flowers uh, in March. And uh, the birds will eat the seeds that result from these. It, as I said, it's uh, excellent for both edging and erosion control. Our next invasive ground cover is another very popular one, periwinkle. This was introduced from the Mediterranean uh, in the 1700s and now is invasive throughout pretty much the entire Eastern United States. It can spread to both fields and roadsides and covers large areas in woodland understory. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, it's commonly sold as a ground cover. If you're interested in having an evergreen ground cover with some attractive flowers, these are two native alternatives, moss phlox and wild pink. Moss phlox, phlox subulata, is actually one of the most popular plants in the horticulture trade, and many people may not even realize that, that it is a native plant. It's uh, a spreading mat forming plant about four to six inches high, and it spreads, as you can see, about one to two feet. Uh, it's evergreen with needle-like leaves that form dense carpets that can help to stabilize soil. It's covered profusely with flowers from March to May and is a great uh, early season nectar source for our beneficial pollinators. My other example is wild pink, Silene caroliniana. Uh, it's also a mat forming plant, uh, more, more mounding in shape. Um, it's six to 12 inches high and wide. It also has abundant blooms from April to May, another early important nectar source. It's evergreen and it spreads via stolons. Those are little above ground stems. And this is what it looks like in the winter time, uh, get fall, fall into winter. There are several other invasive ground covers that I've created fact sheets for. Those are Creeping Jenny, Japanese Pachysandra and Winter Creeper. And you'll learn more about those and lots of other native ground covers in this presentation, which is uh, available, the recording's available on our website. You'll see the URL on the resources page. Are there any questions at this point, Colleen? Uh, Elaine, we have no questions at this point. Um, I. Uh, I I was actually wondering if you um, if you would have any comments about, you mentioned that we're in a good region. Are we being uh, swayed south because of climate change at all? Well, climate change is certainly bringing warmer temperatures to every single season. So we may want to look to plants that uh, are perhaps a, a little bit more in in the, in the southern range. The important thing is to try to get plants uh, from, from nurseries that, that are local to support those local nurseries because they're going to have what are referred to as the local ecotypes, the plants that are, are really uh, native to this region. They've, they've been pollinated here, they've uh, set seed here, and so the seeds are, are going to be adapted to our local, local environment. Okay, um, there were a bunch of questions on removing invasives, but I know you're gonna get to that later yes. on in the talk. And, um, we just got a late question. Um, is American wintergreen a good alternative for vinca? It's a, a really attractive native plant, Bacteria procumbens. Uh, a number of us, a number of local master gardeners have had a little bit of a challenge growing it. And so that's why I did not recommend it here, but it is available in uh, local native plant nurseries and uh, 
people who are considering it might want to speak with those nurseries and find out about the best ways to, to, to cite that plant. Okay. To, to have it grow. Flour, flour. There was another question uh, wondering if all varieties of Liriope are invasive. Uh, Liriope spicata is the one I think that has more of the underground tendrils, but both Liriope spicata and Liriope muscari are listed as invasive by Arlington County and Alexandria. Okie doke. Uh, I think that's good on the questions. Thank you. Okay, but let's move on. Uh, we'll start looking at a few invasive perennials. Uh, the first is common daylily. This was introduced from Asia back in the late 1800s, and it's now invasive through many of the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, it, in it invades meadows and roadsides and stream banks and forest edges. And it multiplies in a number of ways, both by seeds and by roots uh, to form very dense patches. And it's quite a challenge to uh, remove it because of the little tubers that, that uh, linger underground. If you're looking for a perennial with colorful summer bloom, I have two uh, suggestions. One is a lily, Turk's cap lily, and the other is ox eye sunflower. Turk's cap lily, Lilium superbum is uh, considerably taller than, uh, than the daylily uh, at four to seven feet. Um, but it's uh, just absolutely amazing. A single plant can be covered with uh, up to 80, uh, excuse me, 40 flowers. It grows in sun to part shade and moist to wet conditions. And these uh, showy flowers with the retroflexed petals uh, bloom from July to August, attracting both hummingbirds and insect pollinators. One warning is that deer may damage this plant. Now this isn't uh, a lily, but a very attractive uh, summer blooming plant. Oxy sunflower, Heliopsis helianthoides, is an upright clumping plant about three to six feet tall. Uh, it tends to grow more in, in sunny conditions. And uh, in pollinator trials that were conducted a number of years back by uh, Penn State Extension, it was discovered that this was one of the longest blooming plants that brought uh, the greatest variety of pollinators. It blooms from June through to September and offers both pollen and nectar for our pollinators and seed for our birds. It can spread by self-sowing, but you, you can control it. Uh, just by, by lifting out spreading plants if, if you don't want it to reach beyond a, a certain area of your beds. Uh, another invasive plant to our region is Lesser Celandine. This is a native of Eurasia and is now invasive in a good part of the United States, south to Tennessee. The big problem with this plant is that it emerges very early before our native spring wildflowers and then it's allowed to spread and form impenetrable blankets and removal of the tubers is challenging. And unfortunately, it's still commercially available. If you're looking for low growing spring blooming perennials, I have two suggestions. They're both uh, yellow flowered. One is golden ragwort and the other is green and gold. Golden ragwort has a clump forming uh, leaves, basal leaves. They're very, very glossy and they remain evergreen through the season. Uh, they also provide nourishment to our Lepidoptera. In April, those uh, low growing parts of the plant will send up these tall stems, maybe about 18 inches tall, and they are topped by these uh, flat clusters of daisy-like flowers that attract both bees and butterflies. Now this plant uh, can spread both via self-seeding and root colonizing, and this makes it a really effective ground cover. In fact, uh, our local Audubon at Home program really highly recommends this plant as a uh, a replacement for English ivy because it uh, can adapt to many conditions, as you can see here, sun to shade and moist to wet conditions, really great on slopes uh, as an effective ground cover. The other substitute uh, would be our matte forming green and gold, Chrysogonum virginianum. 
It uh, grows only about six to 12 inches high, makes a really nice edging plant because it spreads easily via rhizomes. It has these starry uh, five petaled composite flowers uh, from March to June, very velvety foliage. A few other invasive perennials, non-natives in our region are Italian arum, purple loosestrife, and yellow flag iris. These two are especially problematic in, uh, in uh, wetland areas. And you can learn more about these from uh, fact sheets I've uh, provided. Uh, I have links for those on, on your plant list. We'll look now at some invasive shrubs. The first is probably one of the most popular invasive uh, shrubs, a butterfly bush. This was introduced from China in the early 1900s and unfortunately is invasive through much of the United States. The problem is that it uh, produces abundant seed that's dispersed by the wind. This plant that I photographed in this hell strip, for example, is a volunteer. It was not planted by anyone. Right across the street was a garden that had a butterfly bush and the seeds were carried across here and uh, it can spread then uh, to other areas. It forms very dense and shrubby thickets. Some people think that uh, an, uh, a solution to its invasiveness would be to purchase cultivars, but I understand that some of those may not remain sterile. Uh, by attracting uh, pollinators to this plant, it reduces the pollination of native plants. And perhaps the most uh, serious problem for butterfly bush is that it does not serve as a butterfly host plant. It attracts uh, the adult butterflies to its sweet nectar, but it's not uh, serving the, the full life cycle. It uh, won't, uh, its foliage will not feed the caterpillar stage of, of butterflies. So I'd like to propose some alternatives. There are three, sweet pepper bush, New Jersey tea, and steeple bush. Sweet pepper bush, Clethra alnifolia is an upright shrub, uh, grows about six to 12 feet high. It has fragrant flowers uh, from July to August. And as you can see, just extremely attractive to butterflies and also uh, draws hummingbirds and bees. In the fall, uh, the foliage turns this bright golden color, and then it uh, develops these very interesting seeds that uh, are, uh, remain on the, on the shrub for in interest through uh, the winter into the spring, and birds will be able to enjoy this fruit. Another native shrub is New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus. This is another upright shrub, a little bit shorter, at three to four feet. Now, the great thing about this plant is it has a massive deep root system, and that allows it to grow in very sunny, very dry conditions. So uh, hell strips like that uh, parking lot situation that I was uh, referring to earlier. It has fragrant flowers in June that provide nectar, not just for butterflies, but for other insects. And it, very importantly, it is also a larval host for butterflies. Uh, after these flowers are pollinated, it develops this very interesting fruit that will remain on the plant, uh, providing winter interest. And the leaves for this uh, plant were actually used by the colonists as a tea substitute, and it even today can be used in that manner. And our third alternative is steeple bush. Spirea tomentosa. This is a mound-shaped shrub about two to four feet high and as you can see it can spread to make a, a nice colony in sun to part shade. It has these very attractive flowers that look not unlike the, uh, the non-native spirea from July to September. Uh, they don't have nectar but they do have abundant pollen and very importantly uh, the foliage can uh, serve as a larval host for both butterflies and moths. Uh, our next invasive shrub is Rose of Sharon. This was introduced from South Korea where it is the, the native flower, uh, the, the, the uh, 
the, the, the national flower, I should say. Uh, it's now invasive in much of the Eastern United States and colonizes fence rows. I know I see lots of it spreading uh, in my neighborhood. It spreads uh, easily by the seeds that are uh, carried on the wind and the plants can easily take, take root. I find that even the very small seedlings are very woody and hard to dig out. You can't just pull them easily. You'll, you'll need to, to use a trowel to get them out. It has a deep tap root that makes the, uh, the more mature plants even more difficult to eradicate and it can survive in very harsh conditions. Now, this is a hibiscus. It's in the hibiscus family, hibiscus syriacus. So I'm going to suggest as an alternative, if you're looking for a shrub with large exotic blossoms, that you look at two native hibiscus, marshmallow hibiscus and scarlet rose mallow. Marshmallow hibiscus, hibiscus moschutos, uh, is a shrubby perennial, uh, not really a, shrub, a, a true shrub. It grows about three to seven feet high and particularly likes uh, moist conditions. This is uh, beside a pond at um, Meadow, Meadowlark Gardens. It has these really attractive flowers that uh, open up uh, for one day each in succession from July to September, and they attract uh, hummingbirds and bees to the nectar. The, the leaves uh, will provide nourishment for Lepidoptera. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the cultivars of this plant that come in many colors and have what are described as dinner plate size flowers. Those are, are not native, they're cultivars, but they are, are benign. Uh, another great native example is Hibiscus coccineus, scarlet rose mallow. This is a woody based perennial, very sturdy, that grows about three to six feet high, uh, again, in moist conditions, and it's reported to be deer resistant. It has these amazing uh, flowers, very brilliant red flowers that measure about five inches across from June to September that attract hummingbirds and butterflies. Uh, our next invasive shrub is leatherleaf mahonia. This was introduced from China several hundred years ago and is now invasive all up and down the East Coast from Maryland to Florida. Birds can spread these uh, seeds and it can form very dense thickets in many sites. Uh, the, the problem in the forest areas is that deer uh, will avoid browsing on it so it can, can survive where other native shrubs would be damaged by the deer. And its prickly leaves actually make it rather challenging to handle in our, our cultivation. Uh, if you're looking for an attractive shrub with fruit, I have three native alternatives to propose. They are inkberry, winterberry, and black chokeberry. Inkberry is uh, Ilex glabra, uh, a native evergreen holly that has a, a, a rounded habit. It grows a, uh, a, about six to 10 feet tall, although shorter cultivars are available. Uh, so it, with its evergreen nature, it can provide great uh, cover for, for birds. It has these very delicate flowers that form in May to June. We wouldn't particularly pay attention to them, but bees will seek their nectar. Now this is what's referred to as a dioecious plant. That means that there are both male and female separate plants, each that have their own flowers. And when the female plants uh, are pollinated, they will form this attractive fruit and that will remain on the plant from September to March as a food source for birds. Uh, another lovely native holly is Ilex verticillata. This one is a deciduous holly. Again, uh, reaches usually about six to 12 feet high with some shorter cultivars available. Again, a dioecious plant. So you'll want to pair it, pair a male and a female plant that have the same bloom time. And they will produce, the females will produce a very desirable fruit. Now, a good many of the named cultivars will have uh, red fruit, but this one has a, a, a gorgeous orange fruit. Uh, this is winter gold.
So this is the, uh, the third recommended uh, shrub, black chokeberry, um, Aronia melena carpa. This is one I really enjoy growing. It's an upright shrub about three to six feet high with really attractive glossy foliage that uh, provides nourishment to our Lepidoptera. In the spring, it has these clusters of white flowers from April to May that attract bees. And then uh, when those are pollinated in the fall, it will provide this fruit that is enjoyed by birds. And um, I was starting to mention when I realized I uh, was no longer online that there are unfortunately quite a few other invasive shrubs in our area. They include autumn olive, burning bush, which spreads uh, tremendously fo through forest areas, bush honeysuckle, Japanese barberry that, uh, that is a, a nursery for ticks, Japanese spirea, nandina that can be toxic to animals, uh, including cedar waxwings, privets, and uh, all of the Asian viburnums. Uh, there are fact sheets that I've created for each one of those categories of plants, and I have a, a, a detailed discussion about those and other native alternatives in this presentation that you will find a recording for on our MGNV website. Okay, so we're ready uh, to take any uh, additional questions at this point, Colleen. Okie doke, we have a few. Um, people asked about growing conditions for pepper bush, New Jersey tea, and steeple bush. Okay, um, the, the, the clethra uh, can, can grow in, in sunnier conditions as long as it has plenty of moisture. It really, uh, I, I think of it more as, as a, an understory plant. I've seen it growing very successfully uh, in an understory and it tends to, to want more, more moisture. Uh, the steeple bush can grow, uh, in, I've seen it in full, full sun with just uh, average moisture uh, would be fine. And then uh, let's see, the, the other one, oh, the New Jersey tea. That one is outstanding because it can really take those uh, sunnier, hotter, drier conditions. It has a, a very well-established, extensive, deep root system. And uh, so I was mentioning that I've seen it actually growing in those uh, narrow hell strips in a, in a parking lot very successfully. And the same for steeple bush? Uh, steeple, steeple bush, I think, take. Uh, takes sun to part shade okay. and uh, an average moisture. Okie doke. Um, one, one person asked if you're aware of any legislation to prevent nurseries from selling invasive species. No, that's, that's a really unfortunate situation. Yeah. Uh, counties can do their best to, uh, to produce these lists of, of plants that they consider invasive, and yet it's very difficult to get this information out to the general public. That's why I'm giving this presentation today, and I'm trying to share the, the URLs, the links, so that, that uh, residents can actually go, they can see the full list of plants that are considered invasive. Now, the only legislation that I have heard of and this was speaking with uh, a newly hired uh, uh, individual in our park system, is that, that Virginia, the Virginia legislature has determined that uh, bamboo uh, is problematic, is very invasive and problematic. And if counties want to enact their own local legislation, uh, those, those jurisdictions can impose fines on residents that allow bamboo to grow beyond the limits of their own yards. And they, they can be charged hundreds of dollars uh, repeatedly over and over a period of time. Um, so this park uh, service employee uh, was, this naturalist was, was hoping that maybe Arlington and, and Alexandria would enact that kind of legislation to to have residents who grow this uh, invasive plant take it, take it more seriously. But as far as I know, that, that has not been uh, enacted locally. It's just at this point, a Virginia state uh, rule. Okay, great. Um, are there any ferns that you would characterize as invasive? Uh, Hay-scented fern, I, I wouldn't use the term invasive, but it, it can be aggressive, yes. It can, in, in uh, optimum growing conditions, it can 
really spread quite aggressively, quite vigorously. Okay, dope. Um, one questioner has had trouble locating a male Ilex glab glabra. Do you have any uh, advice? Uh, well, one of the challenges of uh, dioecious plants is that if the plants uh, at the time that you're purchasing them are not in flower or are not in fruit, it's really hard, it can be hard to tell which ones are the males and which ones are the females. The, the best advice I have is to try to actually physically go to native plant nurseries. Uh, those growers are going to be uh, very aware of the, the special uh, attention that you need to, to take to make the proper plant selection. And I will be uh, giving some information about native plant sources at the, at the end of the talk. Okay, thanks, Elaine. A uh, final question, is uh, chokeberry dioecious? Uh, chokeberry is, is not. Several okay. of the others that I mentioned are that the two, uh, the two hollies, Ilex glabra, the inkberry, and winterberry, uh, Ilex verticillata, are dioecious, but the, but the other is not. Okay, great. That's, that does it for the questions for now. Okay, and for anyone who's uh, interested, this is an example of, of how burning bush can just take over the whole uh, understory of a forest. Okay, moving on to some invasive trees. Uh, our first example is calorie pear. Now, the original straight species of this is native to China and Vietnam, but it was brought to this country and the Bradford cultivar was uh, developed, uh, I believe right here locally at the US National Arboretum. Unfortunately, it's been discovered that this is quite a problematic plant. It's been uh, uh, planted in high density in quite a few urban and suburban uh, settings. And here are the issues with it. It can fruit after only three years, and those fruits produce uh, copious seeds that are then carried uh, far distances by birds. It forms dense thickets along forests and roadsides. This uh, picture was taken, I, I just had to pull over and take this photo. Uh, this is along uh, Route 395 going south uh, out of, out of Arlington and all up and down Route 95, you'll see uh, dense thickets of, of this plant just taking over, really troublesome. Additionally, this plant can cross pollinate with other pear species that can produce fertile hybrids. And some of those wild forms will actually revert back. They'll, they'll take on some of the characteristics of the original uh, plant, which have thorns. Another problem with uh, calorie pear, uh, in addition to that uh, aggressive growth, is its, uh, its growth habit. It has very narrow branch angles that require substantial pruning, and heavy branches can actually split off after wind or ice storms. This was right in my neighborhood, an entire street blocked off. If you're looking for a mid-sized tree that has both attractive blossoms and uh, possibly fall color. I have some native suggestions. Uh, downy service berry, fringe tree, and flowering dogwood. Service berry is one of the Amelanchier species, Amelanchier arborea. Um, it's a multi-stem tree, about 15 to 25 feet high, growing in sun to part shade in moist uh, conditions. It has, it's really a four season uh, plant. It has these lovely flowers in March to April that are an important early nectar source for native bees. Then the poll uh, pollinated flowers will develop fruit that's enjoyed by birds and uh, can be uh, used in, in cooking by, by humans as well. It's also a larval host for Lepidoptera. In the fall, it has this gorgeous, uh, bright orange color, and just the plain uh, mottled uh, bark of the trunk is attractive in the winter time. Now, one important thing to point out is that this tree is an alternate host 
uh, for cedar rust disease. So if you have any cedars, um, either trees, cedar trees, or the low growing cedar ground covers, you wouldn't want to plant this near that. That would be, uh, the fruit would be effective with really uh, uh, unattractive orange growths. My second recommendation uh, as a substitute is fringe tree, Cyanthus virginicus. This is another multi-stem tree, a little taller at 20 to 35 feet, uh, sun to shade conditions, and it likes moist soil. Uh, it has flowers uh, from May to June that attract bees, and the, it's, uh, the foliage uh, serves as a larval host for the moths. Now, this is another dioecious plant. You would want to have both a male and a female if you wanted the female to bear fruit. Uh, it, it actually looks a bit like olive, and it is in the olive family. And uh, one thing to note, if you have deer, uh, is that this uh, particular tree may be damaged by them. My third substitute for the uh, Bradford pear, the calorie pear, is our uh, state flower, flowering dogwood, Cornus florida. And I think this is pretty familiar with its horizontal branches, uh, about 15 to 30 feet tall. It grows in sunny conditions, but I tend to think of it more as an understory plant. I, my, I myself view, uh, use it in part shade. Uh, with moist soil. It would certainly need uh, more water in sunny conditions. Now, the interesting thing is that many people uh, regard the uh, either the, the pink or the uh, yellow uh, parts of, of the plant that you see as the flowers. These are actually the flowers, uh, the central portions. The, the colorful parts are actually brats and those appear in April to May, uh, and the flowers uh, attract small bees and flies. Uh, it also has uh, really attractive showy fall foliage and fruit. Uh, as I mentioned, it's intolerant of heat and drought, so you're, you're going to want to cite it carefully, and as I said, I use it more in an understory condition. Uh, another very popular uh, uh, tree is mimosa. This was introduced from Asia uh, back in the 1700s and unfortunately is invasive all the way from Florida uh, to Louisiana. It spreads along roadsides and it really forms uh, it, huge stands at forest edges. The seeds uh, can be viable for years, and if these were to drop in water, they could be carried long distances and then re-sprout, and it also re-sprouts when it's cut back. Now, if you're looking for an ornamental uh, tree with showy flowers, I have some re uh, recommendations, some native species, uh, eastern redbud, witch hazel, and red buckeye. Eastern red bud is Cercus canadensis. It has a short trunk and uh, a round crown growing about 15 to 30 feet tall. Um, it can grow from sun to shade. I, again, I think of it as, as more of a, an understory tree. Uh, it has blossoms that I'm sure most uh, viewers are familiar with from April to May. And interestingly, many of them can grow directly from the branches and even the trunk itself. These are an important uh, early nectar source. It has really attractive uh, yellow fall foliage and then develops these seed pods, not unlike those of, of the mimosa, but these will actually serve as food for birds and the leaves will uh, serve as a larval host for Lepidoptera. Now, just an alert, a uh, deer may damage the, the young shoots of this plant. Uh, another great uh, native tree is witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana. Uh, many people, of course, are familiar with the extract that's made from the twigs and the bark and used medicinally. This is a multi-stem tree, about 15 to 20 feet high. Uh, it can sucker to form a colony in sun to part shade. Uh, it has really attractive yellow and orange fall foliage and the leaves uh, provide nourishment for moths. 
Now the, the outstanding feature of this particular tree is its flowers. This is the latest blooming of, of any of our native species. It flowers in the period September to December. So while the, the branches of, of all other trees and even this tree itself are, are bare. This is um, interesting because it's pollinated by owlet moths. These are a kind of moth that has somehow adapted to be able to fly even at night in very cold uh, temperatures. It, its body uh, vibrates in such a way that it, that it provides uh, warmth so it can pollinate the flowers. And it also uh, is, is uh, given a larval host support by the, the foliage. Uh, another uh, bright flowering uh, native plant is red buckeye, Aeschylus pavia. This one is another one with a rounded crown. Uh, some people even consider it right uh, ranging between shrub and tree height at 12 to 15 feet. It can grow in sun to part shade in moist soil. It has these really attractive spires, bright uh, spires of flowers from late April to early May. And those will attract uh, not only hummingbirds, but butterflies and other insects. Then these uh, interesting husked seeds with the so-called buck eyes inside will develop in the fall. And it has very interesting palmate leaves. Another troublesome plant in our region is Tree of Heaven, introduced many years ago from China, and it's now invasive in natural areas in 30 states. This tree both seeds prolifically and grows vigorously uh, feet uh, at a time, and entire thickets can really displace native vegetation. Uh, additionally, it is allelopathic. That means that it has uh, chemicals, it produces chemicals that it sends out through its roots into the surrounding soil that prevents uh, other plants from growing near it. Uh, in, if it were to grow in our cultivated areas, it can cause damage to sewers and other structures. If you're looking for a, a medium-sized tree with interesting foliage, I have three native alternatives to recommend. Staghorn sumac, sourwood, and sassafras. Staghorn sumac is one of several uh, locally native sumacs. This one is Rus typhina. It's a colony forming plant about 15 to 25 feet high. Uh, I don't usually think of uh, looking for the flowers, but it does flower. Uh, those are, flowers are attractive to both bees and native flies. Uh, it grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist conditions. And the interesting thing, of course, is the summer fruit that forms, and this will persist even dried into the winter time. It's enjoyed by birds and uh, humans use it. Uh, foragers describe making a lemonade from the uh, fuzzy coating on, on the fruit. And uh, this is what also serves as the sumac that's used in Middle Eastern cooking, the spice. Uh, as far as replacing uh, foliage of uh, an invasive plant, uh, this uh, sumac has really striking fall foliage, brilliant colors. And it gets its name, staghorn, because of this velvet covering on the twigs. And speaking of deer, deer may do some damage to the, the tender young branches of this plant. Another plant with really attractive foliage is Oxydendrum arboreum, sourwood. This is a slow growing tree, although it will eventually reach about 20 to 50 feet. It grows in sun to part shade and moist conditions. Uh, it's really recommend, uh, recognized locally because of the flowers. Uh, honey bees can make a valued honey from it, and it also attracts uh, other native pollinators as well. Uh, it's in bloom from June to July. Then it really takes on brilliance in the fall with this attractive foliage, and the fruit uh, persists. These uh, fruit capital, capsules persist on through the, the winter into the spring. Now, two things uh, to note, deer may browse the tender uh, 
twigs of this plant. And it is also more sensitive than other trees to urban stresses. So you would want to speak with a, a, a nursery person carefully and, and cite it very carefully. Uh, our final example of a native tree with really interesting foliage is sassafras, sassafras albidum. This uh, grows about 35 to 50 feet high. It has rather an irregular shape. It grows in sun, but also I think of it as an understory tree in part shade, and it can form uh, dense thickets. In the spring, it has these really delicate yellow flowers in April that attract native bees. And the notable thing ab about this tree is that it has three different leaf shapes. It, it has just uh, these, these oval leaved forms. It has uh, leaves with two lobes and then lobes, uh, uh, leaves with three lobes. Uh, and those leaves provide nourishment for Lepidoptera. Unfortunately, as with the shrubs, there are quite a few non-native uh, tree species, uh, most of them from, from Asia, some from Europe, that uh, are considered invasive in uh, our region. Some, not all, of the, of the cherries and the crab apples. Uh, some of the elms, uh, Siberian elm is, is one. Golden rain tree is one that I just learned is now considered invasive. And a tree that I know is very popular in landscaping in our region, Japanese maple, can spread to forest understories. Norway maple is a very problematic uh, just because of its dense foliage and seed production. Princess tree, the same thing. Uh, sawtooth oak. White mulberry can actually uh, interbreed with our native red mulberry and, and cause a lot of problems. And willows uh, have both uh, unattractive growth habits that uh, cause a, a lot of dropping of small twiglets and actual breaking and cracking of branches. And uh, any of those seeds can be dropped uh, in water and carried uh, long distances. So look for uh, the fact sheets on those for more information and suggestions on alternatives to those. Uh, finally, we'll look at some invasive vines. The first is Asian wisteria. Uh, this comes from both uh, Japan, uh, wisteria floribunda, and China, wisteria sinensis. And it was introduced several hundred years ago and is now invasive in both the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. Uh, it grows very, very uh, aggressively, uh, 15 inches in diameter at the base and 65 feet in length. When it uh, grows, it can actually grow up and smother trees, uh, decreasing light to the plants that are growing below them. And it adds considerable weight to the trees themselves, making them more susceptible to storm damage. If you're looking for a vine with showy flowers, I have several suggestions. Uh, one is uh, American wisteria, and the other is Carolina jessamine. American wisteria, uh, is a climbing deciduous vine. It uh, reaches shorter heights, about 15 to 30 feet in height, and it grows in sun to part shade and moist to wet conditions. It has beautiful flowers, not as fragrant as, as the invasives, but really attractive from April to August, and it blooms, uh, begins blooming when the plants are fairly young. Uh, this will attract butterflies and hummingbirds. My other native suggestion is Carolina jessamine, Gelsemium sempervirens. This is a climbing evergreen vine that reaches uh, 10 to 20 feet in sun to part shade. This uh, will develop fragrant, long lasting flowers that will actually start as early as December if the winter weather is warm. And those flowers will attract bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Japanese honeysuckle, another uh, invasive plant. There's both a, a bush version and right here I'm discussing the, the vine. This was introduced from Japan uh, in the early 1800s and is invasive in the whole uh, eastern half of the United States. Seeds disperse uh, both by birds uh, and by animals. 
uh, when they, they fly or move to other areas. And it has a, a very aggressive growth rate. Uh, like some of the other vines, it can smother trees and shrubs. And so it's reducing light for photosynthesis to any of the plants in the forest understory. If you're looking for a vine with fragrant flowers, there are two suggestions, trumpet, honeysuckle, and cross vine. Uh, our native trump, uh, honeysuckle, trumpet honeysuckle, is another Lonicera. This is Lonicera semper virens. It is a twining semi evergreen vine. Uh, I've had mine remain pretty much evergreen in our milder uh, winter weathers. And in addition, uh, it flowers intermittently through a good part of the year. Uh, I've had uh, some of the blossoms still remaining on the vine as, as late as November and December. These attractive uh, flowers have uh, orangey red outsides and yellow centers, and they will attract bees, butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds. Uh, the plant will fruit uh, all the way from August uh, to March, as long as it's flowering, it, it will, and is pollinated, it will develop fruit. And so that's a great uh, source of food for birds. And additionally, it is a larval host for moths. Cross vine is an, another good substitute. This is a climbing semi evergreen vine, and this one spreads fairly rapidly by root suckers. This is one that I would describe as fairly uh, vigorous and aggressive. So you would want to cite this one carefully and, and monitor its, uh, its growth habit. It has really attractive, uh, fragrant tubular flowers from May to June that attract butterflies and hummingbirds. And finally, a uh, sweet autumn clematis. This was introduced from Asia in the late 1800s, another one that's invasive uh, throughout a, a good part of the United States. This one escapes into fence rows and roadsides. And as you can see, this is right on my block. Uh, someone allowed a vine to grow on her fence, and it is now engulfing her azaleas and her rhododendrons. It produces vast quantities of wind dispersed seeds, and even when this is cut back, it will still continue re sprouting from its roots. Uh, I have a native suggestion if you're looking for a vine with fragrant flowers, and that is the native Virgin, uh, virgin Spower. This is Clematis virginiana. It's a climbing vine. It grows six to 20 feet in length in sun to part shade and dry to wet conditions. This one is dioecious, although some plants can actually have both male and female flowers, I understand. Uh, it's semi evergreen. And the way to tell the difference between this and the invasive species is that the invasive vine has smooth edges to its leaves and this one has, uh, has lobes to uh, edging to the, to the leaves, to, uh, toothed edging to the leaves. It has fragrant flowers from July to September that attract uh, bees and wasps and others. There are several other invasive vines in our region, five-leaved akebia, oriental bittersweet, and porcelain berry. And you can learn more about those from the fact sheets that I've provided. To conclude, I'd like to uh, provide a little bit of information on controlling invasive plants in case you've discovered that some of these species I've mentioned are uh, actually growing on your property and you would like to remove them. Some general principles are to, if at all possible, remove the plants when, when they're young. It's going to be a lot easier to control them at, at that stage. If you can uh, remove flowers and berries, that's another way to control growth. And you certainly don't want to recycle them with uh, any organic material that would be going to the county. You want to bag these up and consider them as trash. So uh, what I've done is I've provided a second handout uh, because I'm gonna be providing so many uh, details. I thought you would find it helpful rather than taking uh, copious notes yourself to, to have actual uh, photographs of, of the slides. So you uh, will be able to refer to those for details. 
Uh, the first uh, set of information is on controlling different ground covers. Uh, it's best to try to do this when the soil is moist. And ideally, you would start from one side and just work a small section at a time. Try to be methodical about it. Um, you will pry up the soil and try to break apart um, the, the soil and, and removing the roots. And it might be a good idea to actually let the, the soil that you've turned over uh, dry out a bit so you can go back through that and, and check for any remaining roots that were left behind. Uh, you would certainly, as I mentioned, bag and discard um, any, any of those roots to prevent rerooting. And uh, one approach uh, would be if you want to replant with native species, and perhaps you have a, an extensive area like this, uh, just begin removing a certain area as you have time and, and finances, and then carefully mulch and begin planting uh, spaced uh, plugs of, of your native replacement plant, then the next year maybe you can take on another area and slowly over time replace that with your desirable native. Uh, some tips specifically on removing English ivy from the ground. Uh, I recommend using this team approach that I saw at an invasive pole. One person actually digs at the soil uh, with a shovel or you could uh, use a pickaxe as Colleen has recommended. Uh, I saw it used with a shovel um, and uh, the shovel was used at a 45 degree angle uh, digging <clears throat> down into the soil at the roots of the ivy. The team member actually was able, as the soil was loosened up, rather than pulling separate little sections loose, to actually roll up this entire stretch of ivy as a, a rug as it was loosened. What you want to do once you've uh, created that, that carpet is to let the vines dry out and then shake off any remaining soil. Then you'll bag up and dispose of all of, all of that growth in the trash. And then, as I mentioned with uh, the other example, to begin replanting with some native species. If you have English ivy that's gr actually grown up onto your trees, this is the way to deal with that. You want to cut the runners uh, several feet up the trunk and then very gently peel those runners down to the tree roots. Now, if they've grown as substantial as this, uh, this is several inches uh, in diameter. This was a tree uh, growing on my son's uh, property in Chattanooga. And I actually began taking a, a sawzall to it to, to, to cut through. You want to peel the runners down and then you want to continue removing any of the roots and the runners uh, as far around the base of the tree as you can. Then you're going to bag those cut sections and place those directly in the trash. Then you're going to allow the remaining ivy uh, farther up the trunk to actually die. Once, once the roots have remained here, it will die and it will dry up and eventually over time uh, those leaves will, will blow away. If you have bamboo, there are several approaches. You can do what we were doing here at an invasive pull, actually cut the stalks or mow any emerging shoots, mow that down to the ground regularly. This is a, a slow process. It can take as long as three years to actually deplete the energy of, of the plant and kill the stand. Uh, another approach would be to try to actually dig down uh, at least a foot to remove the roots and using a pickaxe is probably the best way to approach that. Now, unfortunately, the plants can renew if there are any lingering rhizomes. So you're going to have to re repeat that digging process uh, for any newly uh, emerging shoots uh, over a, uh, up to a year. If you want to control vines, uh, as I mentioned, try to hand pull any small plants, removing uh, as much of the root system as possible. Uh, if they are going to fruit, certainly uh, try to cut that and bag that up to prevent reseeding. And if you have large roots, try to cut them at the base. And again, use your, uh, your heavy tools to dig up the roots if possible. Now, if, that is, if this is, has just established uh, so uh, vigorously 
uh, and tenaciously, you may have to use spot applications of minimal amounts of herbicide on, on the cuts. You would want to do it when you've done a fresh cut, just uh, paint it very carefully, spray or paint it with a brush so it's not going to, the herbicide isn't going to be affecting the, uh, the surrounding foliage and plants, and it would be taken in systemically to eventually uh, kill that vine. Again, bag up and dispose of the plant in, uh, in the trash and uh, just monitor it. If, it. if you see regrowth, you may need to repeat these different steps. Uh, as far as controlling shrubs, you'll want to start by removing any smaller branches with, with your uh, hand tools like pruners and hand saws and then leave a central stem that you can use uh, to give you some leverage when you're using your shovel or your pickaxe uh, to pry it up. For very large shrubs, you can do what I was uh, describing for the vines. You can cut the, the stems down to maybe just uh, allowing two inches above the ground and then go uh, with your uh, selected herbicide and paint that very carefully. And again, monitor and repeat as necessary. As far as controlling trees, that's going to be more problematic. Again, if you have uh, identified uh, an invasive tree when it's in a seedling state up to maybe two inches in diameter, you should be able to use a, a shovel or a pickaxe to, to pry that out. If there are larger saplings, strip the bark from the stump because uh, the bark is going to be protective and then that will allow you to paint that cut surface and you can monitor and retreat as necessary. Uh, two other approaches, if the tree is, is significantly larger, you can actually cut down a large tree, but then you could leave the down tree if you have the space uh, to actually serve as habitat for wildlife. Or you could do what's shown here, you can girdle the tree with an ax or a chainsaw and then retain the, what's referred to as the snag for wildlife. There'll be all kinds of animals that would be able to, to make use of that remaining tree if you have the, the room for that. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that um, I've heard some very interesting comments by Doug Tallamy, the uh, famous entomologist and environmentalist who has written a number of, of books on uh, controlling invasives and certainly replacing them with desirable native plants. And he says whenever possible, uh, he makes use of what he terms the manual control methods to control the invasive plants. But he described how in certain circumstances, he and his wife were repeatedly trying to dig up some of the more tenacious vines and uh, shrubs and trees, the, the woody plants. And in those limited circumstances, he made a very selective use of herbicides. But again, he did that very carefully and uh, made sure that they were not spraying be beyond the area that he intended to control. Uh, there'll be a little bit more information ab about uh, control uh, in, in just a few slides. Uh, right now, I'd like to take just a moment to tell you about the services that uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension and Master Gardner, Gardeners of Northern Virginia uh, provide to you, the members of the public. We've been doing this, uh, providing science-based information since 1985. We usually do this with a help desk that, uh, at our Fairlington headquarters that uh, in normal circumstances you could visit. Unfortunately, that building is closed right now, but you can reach us at this website, MG for Master Gardener, ARL for Arlington, ALEX for Alexandria, at gmail.com and you, you can have answers to a great number of, of gardening questions. Um, during normal circumstances, we also hold plant clinics both at the Arlington Central Library and many farmers markets. Those are not functioning right now, but we hope to reinstate those as soon as it's safe. Uh, we have quite a number of demonstration gardens in Arlington and Alexandria, and you can see the locations of those on our website, mgmv.org. 
Uh, this is the last of the public education classes that we'll be presenting this season. But as I mentioned, you're welcome to go to our website and see all the recordings, not just of discussions of sustainable landscaping, but information on other best practices such as composting, treating your uh, lawn, and uh, urban agriculture, growing vegetables and, and herbs. Virginia Cooperative Extension, our particular unit in Arlington and Alexandria, is supported by a nonprofit group, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. We have a wonderful website, mgmv.org, where we post uh, regular original content, uh, weekly articles on many different aspects of gardening. Uh, we have a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. Um, I myself do weekly Facebook posts on native plants and daily Instagram and Twitter posts. And uh, we are also present at annual uh, plant sale at Green Spring Gardens in May. It, as I say, if you are attending from uh, out of our region, please uh, visit your own cooperative extension office for information. Uh, if, uh, as I discussed with the plant lists, you will be taken directly to fact sheets on either invasive plants or uh, our recommended native plants. The invasive plant sheets will give you uh, additional discussion of what the problems are with those plants and a list not just of the natives I've suggested, but, but maybe even more. If you click on those links, it will take you directly to, to the uh, what are referred to as the tried and true fact sheets, the fact sheets on the native plants. Those can be found uh, on the website if you don't follow the, directs, uh, the links directly from from the plant list handout uh, at mgnv.org under the plants menu. And the recordings of our web of our uh, presentations are under uh, public education, the link that's right here. Uh, I've provided links for you on the handouts so you can see the complete lists of invasive plants for Arlington County and Alexandria. And these are two other excellent resources on controlling natives. This resource by Fairfax County has really easy to read uh, diagrams on uh, many of the, native, uh, the invasive plants that I've discussed. Uh, it's in kind of a, a little uh, tabular uh, format. And then the Virginia Department of Forestry has a, a multi-page uh, table on uh, controlling treatments. Again, they're going to recommend that you try the manual methods, but if you absolutely have to resort to an herbicide, it tells you exactly when and how to do that. If you would like to see native plants, as I mentioned, Master Gardeners have many demonstration gardens. Uh, many of the photos that you've seen today were taken either in those gardens, my own garden, or uh, some of these other public gardens, Meadowlark, Botanical Gardens, the Pocket Garden, Nature Conservancy behind their headquarters in Arlington, and Green Spring Gardens. And then in Washington, DC, the US National Arboretum and the United States Botanic Garden. And finally, if you're looking for sources uh, for buying native plants, I urge you to go to the website for Plant Nova Natives, and I give this uh, URL on your handouts. They will list uh, sellers that sell natives exclusively all year round. Some of them are right here in the Northern Virginia area, some a little further afield. And uh, when it's possible, they will also list special sale events that happen throughout the growing season. Uh, any more questions, Colleen? Uh, actually, there are a few. There were quite a lot of questions about controlling invasives, which I think the last part of your presentation covered very nicely. Good. I'm not sure everyone has a sawzall, but <laughs> I have a great mental image of you wielding a sawzall while you work in the garden. <laughs> Not quite, it's not quite as, a, uh, as heavy duty as a, as a chainsaw. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, plugged yeah. in, it's plugged in and powered, but, uh, but it's not quite, quite as uh, heavy duty <laughs> as a chainsaw. I, I, uh, 
Hey, there was a question about telling apart native Mahonia aquifolium, which is sometimes known as Oregon grape, and leather leaf Mahonia. Is there a way to tell those apart? Uh, the, the leather leaf is the one that I think is troublesome here. If I understood the other one, uh, maybe grows on, on the West Coast. Okay. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Um, there was a question about how far to space a uh, service berry from cedar uh, trees. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the problems, the disease uh, carrying factors can reach over hundreds of feet. So if there is, if there is really a, a cedar tree, you know, anywhere within a neighboring yard, it's probably going to be uh, too close to, to plant the, the service berry. Now, that disease does not actually kill the service berry tree. And if you don't mind the unsightliness on, on the fruit, you could have it, you could have it blossom, you could have it fruit, maybe even ca catch some of the fruit before the disease uh, forms on it. And, and it could be attractive the rest of the year, but, ju but just an alert that, that it, it could be an alternative host. Okay. Um, do you have any comments on Japanese knotweed? Uh, I actually wrote this past year a series of articles on other invasive plants, and okay. Japanese knotweed is one of them. I would recommend that uh, viewers go to the website uh, for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, mgnv.org. And in the sidebar, I believe we actually uh, have links to all of the related articles that I've posted on other invasive plants beyond the ones that I've just discussed here. I wanted to focus today on plants that are actually still available in the horticulture trade and that people may uh, unknowingly be buying. I'm not sure that people are going to be buying multiflora rose or buying the Japanese knotweed. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and many there are, are many other um, invasives in our natural areas. But if you want to read about those and including some newly discovered ones, uh, I just, uh, one of our most recent articles uh, talks about uh, five different species that have just been identified in, in Arlington. So uh, maybe in the search, uh, search box also you could type in the term invasive and that would bring up all of the articles uh, on this category of plants. Okay, thank you Elaine, that about covers it. There were many, many uh, thank yous for your wonderful presentations and photography and organization of the talks. Um, so thank you from all of us. You're very welcome. And just to answer any possible questions about this slide, I took this uh, on Route 7 heading out to Leesburg. You can see how the non-native uh, sweet autumn clematis started in this person's yard and then just spread to take over the entire roadside. So my hope is that uh, knowing a little bit more about some invasives can help uh, our local homeowners and even those a little further afield uh, think about ways that they can uh, slowly go about replacing some of those invasives if they have them in their yards and finding uh, very desirable native plants that will have the same ornamental attractive features but will in addition provide support to our wildlife. Thank you everyone. Thank you Elaine, bye bye.